We are on Daf Samech Dalit Omer Aleph. We're at the first set of two dots. Rabbi Yehuda Omer, Af Hatamid Vichule. Now we saw a, multi, a three multiple machloksim in our Mishnah. The Tanakama had just talked about the halacha of when you shecht a korban Pesach on erev Pesach, and it's al hachametz if you have if you have chametz present. And we talked about what that means, having chametz present yesterday. But if you have chametz present, you're over on lo sishchat al chametz dam zivchi. The special halo, a special mitzvah lo sase in the Torah. The Tanakama <coughs> says it only applies to when you're shechting the korban Pesach and erev Pesach. We have a second shita, which is Rebbe Yehuda. Rebbe Yehuda says not only is that true when you shecht the korban Pesach, but it's also true when you shecht the korban tamid on erev Pesach with chametz present. So the Gemara now asks, where does he get it? My time of the Rebbe Yehuda. Omer lecha, zivchi, zevach umaynihu tamid. If you take a look at the Pasuk, it says, lo sizbach al chametz dam zivchi. It says, do not slaughter with chametz present with the blood of my sacrifice. Now there's one sacrifice in the Torah more than any other where HaKadosh Baruch Hu says it's my korban. Like when you look at the language of the korban tamid, it says it's korbani, lachmi, li'ishai. Everything is mine, mine, mine. So what korban is that that HaKadosh Baruch Hu says is especially mine? That's the korban tamid. And therefore, the Pasuk is cueing us that in addition to the korban Pesach, there's also the additional korban tamid. But now we have the third shita of the Mishnah, which is Rabbi Shimon. Rabbi Shimon Omer, ha Pesach be arbaasar vichule. He says, no, I agree with the Tanakama that the only uh, carbon that you can be liable for on Erev Pesach is the carbon Pesach. But during Chol HaMoed, during the rest of Pesach, you can be liable for other carbonos as well. And he doesn't say whether it's carbon tamid or any other carbon, but just as generically <laughs> all carbonos provided that it's a kosher or shechita because the carbon is still kosher. Okay, remember, that's what Rav Shimon Shita was. There's a special halacha for Erev Pesach, Davka, the carbon Pesach. All other days of Pesach, when you bring a carbon, it could be any carbon. As long as there's chametz present, you're in violation. My time at the Rav Shimon. So what's his reasoning? Dechsiv, zivchi, zivchi, trei zimni. Because the truth is, is that there's two times when the Torah says, lo sishchat al chametz dam zivchi. Once is in Parshas Mishpatim, and the other one is in Parshas Kisisa. <coughs> Identical phrases, and the word Zivchi is therefore written twice. What do, you, what do we do with those twice written Zivchi? Kari be Zevach Zivachai. The way that you read it says, the, in a very interesting hermeneutic manipulation, the Gemara says there's, you take the Yud from one word Zevach, <coughs> and you transfer it to the other word Zivchi. So that instead of zivchi in the singular, it becomes zivachai, which would mean my sacrifices in the plural. So one is referring to zevach, which is the carbon pesach, and the other one is referring to all other karbanos. But then why did the Torah separate them out and say that carbon pesach is one pasuk and all other karbanos are another pasuk? Velokas of zivachai, and not just say zivachai once. Lameymar bizman diika zevach lo michai vazivachai. It's to teach you as follows. When there's a mitzvah of bringing the korban Pesach, there's no violation <coughs> for other karbanos when you have chametz present. When there's no longer a mitzvah of korban Pesach, then the principle of zivachai is, is operative, and therefore you're going to be in violation of having chametz present for any other carbon that's a kosher carbon. So that's why you have this bifurcation, this, this breaking out, one halacha for Erev Pesach, when the mitzvah of carbon Pesach is extant, and one for Cholamoid, when you can bring any other carbon and there's no longer a mitzvah of carbon Pesach. Okay, let us go weiter. Then Rav Shimon said, regarding if, let's say, I have a Paschal lamb, right, and I didn't bring it on Erev Pesach, and I have it now during Chalamoid. So if I offer it, that's called Shalom Bismano, I'm offering it at the wrong day, it's no longer Erev Pesach. So what do we know about Shalom Shalo Bismano? It's Pasal, if it's Shalom Bismano, as long as it's done Lishmo. So then, if it's done lishmo and shalom bismano, and therefore the korban pesach is pasul, it turns out that the shechita is not a valid sacrificial shechita, and therefore I'm not in violation of lo sishchat al chametz dam zivchi. I haven't violated that law. 
right? But if I have the double negative of shalo bismano and shalo lishmo, which means now that the carbon is a kosher shlomim, so that, remember that paradox? That if I do it shalo bismano and shalo lishmo, it's a kosher shlomim. So then I am in violation of lo sishchad al chametz dam zibchi because now it's a valid sacrificial slaughter. So the Gemara says, taima de shalo lishmo. So Gemara now makes a very important generic inference from, this, from the way that the Mishnah phrased it. It said in the Mishnah that I need to have a machshava, I need to have the specific intent that this carbon is shalo lishmo in order for it to be a kosher shlomim. Pastama pater, which is mashma, that if I didn't have any thought, I have this leftover paschal lamb that I never used. And I go ahead, I'm not thinking very much of anything. I'm just thinking, hey, I'm going to shech this. Shech that is a korban. I don't think about korban Pesach. I don't think about anything else. It's mashma that it retains its status as what? It retains it, 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 it retains its status of shalolishma, <coughs> right? And amai Pesach b'shor yimosa shana shlomimavi. So why should that be? Why automatically, in other words, why is it, I'm sorry, excuse me, it retains its status of lishma, excuse me, that's where I got confused. It retains its status as a korban pesach. If I don't have any intent whatsoever, then it seems to be that it retains its status as a paschal sacrifice without my saying anything, and therefore I'm, it's, I'm going to be putter for the violation because it's not a valid shechita, because it's shalobi's mano and it's considered to be lishma even without saying anything. But the Gemara says, I don't understand why. Pesach bishar yimosa shana shlamim avi. It should automatically default to being a shlamim without my saying anything, because since it's no longer Erev Pesach, what else can it be used for? It should default, in, not instead of defaulting to a paschal sacrifice, it should default to a shlamim. So therefore, when I'm not thinking anything, it should be a valid shchit. It should be a valid carbon shlamim, and therefore I should be in violation. But you put a shame on it. <clears throat> so one second. But I, yes, I put the shame on it. But the shame should fly off once Erev Pesach has elapsed. That's the Gemara's argument. Shamas Mina. So let's see, let's see the inference the Gemara is saying. So let us infer from here that Pesach bishar yimos hashana boi akira. That like Reb David is saying, that since I already put the name of Pesach on it, in order to remove that name of Pesach, I have to explicitly remove it. It's not just enough to allow Erev Pesach to elapse and then for it to default to a shlamim. It doesn't default automatically to a shlamim. I have to explicitly change it to a shlamim, even after Pesach, Erev Pesach has elapsed. So can we make that inference from here? That's the Gemara's question. Amar Rev Rebbe Chia Bar Gamda, Nizra Kami Pi Chabura Va'amru. No, the guys got together in the base medrash. The Chabura got together, and they concluded that no, it's not. You can't necessarily infer that from here. Why? Because Kegon Shahayu Ba'olim Timei Meis Vnidchin LePesach Sheni Distamal Ushon Pesach Koi. Maybe this Mishnah is talking about a case where the reason why the Paschal Lamb is left over is not because I don't need it anymore. Maybe we're talking about a fellow who couldn't bring his carbon Pesach because he was Tameh, or he was far away from Yerushalayim. And therefore, this lamb retains its default designation as a carbon Pesach because I plan to bring it on the 14th of Iyar. So instead of bringing it on the 14th of year, I decide to shecht it prematurely. So in that situation, and maybe only in that situation, do I have to explicitly remove it from its Pesach status. But it's very altogether possible that if I've already been yotze my korban Pesach with another lamb, then it automatically defaults to a shlam. And therefore the Gemara says basically you have no raya from here one way or the other. Let's go on to the next mission. This next mission is quite lengthy because it goes through the actual logistic protocol of how you offered the Korban Pesach in the Beis HaMikdash on Erev Pesach. So HaPesach Nishchat B'Shalosh Kitos. So the Korban Pesach was offered in three groups. So you separated the Jewish people into three groups, and each group went in sequentially. Shenem Ar B'Shalchatu Oso Kol Kahal Adas Yisrael. Kahal Ve'eda Yisrael. The Pasuk uses three appellations for the Jewish people. It calls them a Kahal, an Eida, and Yisrael. So that tells me that the Torah wants us to break out into three different groups. Nichnasa Kasa Rishona, Nismala Ha'azara, Noalu Dalso Azara. So the first group would go in. 
until the courtyard of the temple would fill up. And then they locked the gates, they locked the doors of the Azara to prevent more people from crowding and pushing in. Okay, so that was the first group. Taku heiriu v'taku, then they blew t'kia shvarim t'kia, right, whatever t'kia, trua t'kia, whatever they, whatever a trua is, and then, right, and then that was to sort of like let them know that it was time to start. And at kohanim omdim shuro shuros, uviyodeim bezichei kesef uvezichei zahav. And the kohanim stood in rows. Now these rows, these lines of kohanim were running from all the way to the, from the back of the Azara, from the, from the east, running all the way towards the west, up to the Mizbeach. And there's basically a re, multiple relay lines. And each line had kohanim that were standing in position. Each one was holding a, go, a bowl that was either made out of gold or made out of silver. Shura shakula kesef. Kesef is shura shakula zahav zahav. But the only thing is, and lo hayu me'uravin, and the only thing is, is that the row that had silver bowls could not have gold bowls, and the row that had gold row that had gold bowls could not have silver bowls. In other words, you you were either part of a line that was exclusively silver silver bowls, or you were part of a line that was exclusively gold bowls. V'lohayu la bezichin shulayim shemayanichum v'yikro shadam. And furthermore, these bowls did not have a flat bottom. They had, you know, like the the old water cooler cups where there was a, it was cone shaped because because they didn't want you to stand by the water cooler too long. Well, that's they wanted you to get a quick drink and then get back to work, that's right? Cool. I think so. I don't know. Maybe, who knows? <laughs> I don't, right? So it's the same thing by the Beis Hamikdash. They didn't want the bowls to be able to be settled down on the ground or on a surface out of a fear that you'd forget about it and the blood would congeal and then it could no longer be used for Zerika. Shachat Yisrael v'kibel hakohen. Then a Yisrael would shech the Korban Pesach, as we know that a Yisrael is allowed to do the Shechita, but the Kohen would have to do the Kabbalah and then from then on it was the Kohen's Avoda. Naosno l'chavero v'chavero l'chavero and then they would do a relay. The Kohen who did the Kabbalah would pass it on to the Kohen in front of him and he would pass it on to the coin in front of him until it made its way all the way down the line on, uh, up until the Mizbeach. So we shift the empties down? One second. Yeah, um, it was... And then at the same time that he would give, right after he would give the full bowl to his coin in front of him, he would take from the coin and the empty bowl that had just been, that would make its way down the row. Kohen hakaro al Mizbeach zarko zurika echas keneged hayeso. And the Kohen who was closest to the Mizbeach on this relay line would then throw the blood, the word Zrika is meaning toss the blood at a distance, against one of the walls of the Mizbeach that had a Yesod, that had a foundation protruding out of it. If those of you familiar with the diagram of the Mizbeach know that the protruding Yesod, the protruding foundation, was only visible on two sides of the Mizbeach, on the north side and on the west side. There was a small part of protruding a foundation on the east and on the south, but only one ama. So you needed to throw it either on the north side of the Mizbeach or on the west side of the Mizbeach. Okay, so once that was done, and everyone in the first group had their carbon Pesach blood thrown on the Mizbeach, then everyone in the first group left, and the second group came in. How do they, do all the, how do they handle all these carbonas? We're going to see. It's the row, uh, one row, like one row. No, it's multiple row. rows. Rows and rows and rows. Rows and rows and rows. Place. Multiple rows running across the entire width of the of the courtyard. Mm-hmm. So somebody so, goes shech, then somebody comes right behind yeah, them, right. again and pass. So yeah, yeah. Where, yeah, where all the animals are. The animals are in the courtyard. No, they, were, they were also lined up. They didn't the animals are in the courtyard shech. lined up. Same time. Okay. okay. Right. Okay. So, so did you start knocking your shoulder? <laughs> What's that? I said the people who are not living in Yerushalayim. They made Aliyah Laregel. They came up. They made a pilgrimage. So they all went to... They all went. This is uh, this is Shalosh Regalim. This is, that's why it's called a regal because you have to make a pilgrimage. But Talk about Pesach. to come into the Beshemidish and there of Pesach? Yeah. Everyone came. Every single Jew who represented... Now, you didn't have to... You didn't have to have every single Jew present. It was if you were the head of your chabura. Mm-hmm. You represented a consortium of, of people who were going to partake of this lamb. So you have sent one representative from your chabura. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll see more. So, Yatsa Sashniya Nichnas Sashlishis. 
this, the, the, the first, so if the first group left and the second group came in and the second group left and the third group came in, and the second group and the third group were an exact duplicate protocol as the first group. And the Levium would be reciting Hallel during the entire tenure of the shift of the group. They would be singing Hallel while this whole avoda was going on. And if it was taking a very long time so that they finished Hallel, before the Yavoda was finished, they would start Halal again. And if they finished it a second time, then they would say it a third time. Mm-hmm. But the reality is, historically, there was never a need to start Halal a third time because the Kohanim was reason. They were very quick and very speedy and efficient in their work. And they were always able, even when the largest throngs of groups came, they were always able to finish the Yavoda before having to start a third Halal. And furthermore, says Rebbe Yehuda, historically, even though you had to break up into three shifts, into three groups, most Jews came early, and they wanted to be part of either the first or at least the second shift, and the third group was therefore much smaller, so that by the it, it was a much faster moving shift, and therefore... Um, the the Levian couldn't even get up to the paragraph of Ahavti Ki Yishma Hashem in the Hallel before everything was done in the third group. This basically is a testimony that the Jewish people were very excited to do the mitzvah, so only a small group of people would even have had to wait for the third third group. Now the Mishnah tells us that when Erev Pesach fell out on Shabbos, there was, you, you did everything exactly the same. So now we're going to go through a few exceptions. First of all, the Chachamim didn't want the Kohanim to wash the floors of the Azara when Erev Pesach fell out on Shabbos. During the weekday, it was quite appropriate to wash the floor. Now, how did you wash the floor? You know, you ever do sponja in, er, in your apartment in Eretz Yisrael? This was a mega sponja. So the way it worked was, is that there was an aqueduct that ran through the Beis HaMikdash and it would flow out to Nachal Kidra. You would, to clean the floors, you would plug up the exit uh, uh, way of this aqueduct. The water would overflow and spill out all over the floor. And this was very important to do, on, especially after the Avod and Erev Pesach, because the floor was filled with blood. I mean, it was mamish bloody, bloody, bloody. There's thousands and thousands of karbanas, right? So... As a result, you had to uh, uh, add a lot of water, and then you would sponge it all in back into the aqueduct, unplug the, uh, the aqueduct, and everything would flow out. The Chachamim did not want the Kohanim to do this on Shabbos. They felt that this was excessive work on Shabbos, but the Kohanim did it anyway. Did Rebbe Yehuda Omer, I have to go fight it. Rebbe Omer, Kos that Rebbe Yehuda says that there was a cup that one Kohen took at the end of all of the uh, avoda, he would take a cup and fill it up with the remaining blood that was on the floor. And then, And what he would do is he would take that blood and splash it against the, the Mizbeach. Why? Because out of a fear that perhaps one someone's carbon Pesach blood never made it to the Mizbeach. Maybe someone's blood spilled out before it got to the Mizbeach. And then, by doing this, you're at least collecting a small portion of that guy's blood that mixed in with everyone else's blood. And that way, you cover all your bases. But the Chachamim said that that's not appropriate. The Gemara will explain tomorrow, Mir Sushem, why. So now, the, the next stage is, you have to flay the animal, and then you cut it open, and you remove its innards. You place the innards on the Mizbeach. And then you take the carcass home with you. That's basically the way it worked. So how did they flay the animal? So, Onkolio shel barzel hayu kavuim bekesolim of amudim shebahen tolon amafshitin that there were already fixed iron loops that were protruding from the walls and the ground in the base hamikdash. This was known as the base mitbachaim. You may be familiar yeah. with that famous diagram of the second temple where there was a, a set of twenty four. Um, uh, vertical loops pro- coming out of the ground, and that's where they would flay the animal normally. Okay, so obviously after the animal's been shechted, they've done the zrika. They bring the carcass 
to that area and they would flay the animal there. Now, but, some, but there were thousands of animals, so you couldn't just use those 24 uh, rings that you had to have other makeshift places where you could flay the animals. So if you didn't have the space that was too long of a line, so maklos dakim v'chalakim hayusham, meniach al ksefo v'al kesef chavero v'tola umavshit. So there were sticks. They were long sticks made out of wood that were smoothed down, sanded down. And you would basically make a makeshift rack by standing two people standing in front of each other, facing each other, <clears throat> I would put the two ends of the two sticks on my shoulders, you put the other two ends on your shoulders, we place the animal on top of this makeshift rack, and we flay the animal with our knives right in front of us, between the two of us. Okay, Rabbi Eliezer Omer, Yudalet Shechalios B'Shabes, Meniach Yodo Al Kesef Chaver, Rabiyad Chaver Al Kseif of Etola Umavshit. Rabbi Eliezer says that that's only good if Erev Pesach was a weekday, but if Erev Pesach was a Shabbos, we didn't want you to use those sticks. Now, it's really unclear from Rashi why. There's two girsos in Rashi. One girsa is, is that you had to, uh, they had to, uh, there was a fear maybe that they would sand down the sticks on Shabbos, and another girsa in Rashi is that the sticks were muktza. I really have difficulty understanding both versions, but the bottom line is, is that the Chachamim said, don't use the sticks on Shabbos. So therefore, what was the alternative method? You took your left arm and you put it on your friend's right shoulder. He took his left arm and put it on your right shoulder. You had your right hand free now, so we have now put the carcass on top of our arms, and we use our right hands with our knives to flay the animal this way. It sounds a little bit awkward, but I guess if there's no other choice, that's what you have to do. So... Vitola uh, umafshin, and that's how you would um, uh, suspend the animal and flay it. Karu vahotzi a murav. So then they would uh, cut open the animal and remove its innards, its uh, kidneys, its fats, and so forth. And nasnu b'megis v'hikdir nol gabi mizbech. They would place all of that on a tray, bring it up to the mizbech, and place it on the mizbech for 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 incineration. Yatsasa. Now, now we go back to a discussion of what happened on Shabbos. Now, if <clears throat> this was a weekday, then the first group would leave. They would take the remaining carcass of their carbon Pesach and go home and prepare for Yontif, right? What if it was Shabbos? You have a problem of Hotzah. You can't carry. You're not allowed to carry this animal home with you. So therefore, you had to linger in the vicinity until Shabbos was over, and then you'd schlep home your carbon Pesach. Okay? So So the first group that leaves would sit outside the temple in the Harabais. I guess there was an Eruv that was considered to be a Rishus Hayachid, a Ma'ura Rishus Hayachid belonging to the temple. Uh, and then they would sit there. Shnia Bechil. The second group, when it would leave, would sit just on the outside of the temple there was a lattice wall that was right outside of the actual wall of the uh, of the temple and that's where they would stay and and the third group would have to remain standing inside the courtyard because there was no other place for them to to linger and and then they would wait until it got dark until Shabbos was over I guess they would say and then they would take their uh, carcass and bring it home with them and, and roast their carbon pesa the Gemara now says, Amar Rabbi Yitzchak, Ein ha-Pesach nishchat, Ela be-Gimel kisa, Shel shloshim shloshim b'nei Adam. That the rule is, that not only do you have to have three groups to, uh, to do the avoda, but you also need within each group a minimum of 30 people. Now why do you need a minimum, where do we get this number 30? So my time, a kahol ve'ed of Yisrael, Mesaf kolani bevas achas yibazeh because when we know when the Torah says the three terms for a Jewish congregation, what is the definition of a congregation? We know that it's a minion, it's ten. So we have three times the word congregation is written, and we, we're not sure whether that means to be all together, three minyanim, or sequentially, three different groups. And so therefore we want to cover both bases and we say, And therefore, let's cover all of our bases. And <clears throat> no, no, no. We, uh, yeah, right. We need 90 people. That would what it would turn out. 30 for the first group, 30 for the second group, and 30 for the third group. That's really basically to cover all your bases. The Gemara now says, But then the Gemara says, you don't need 90 you can get away with 50. 
Why can he get away with 50? Because, because this is only a suffix, he can do it as follows. Da'ayli tlosin va'avdin, ayli asara v'nafki, ayli tlosin va'avdi. So the first 30 would go in for the, for the, for the first group and do their avoda. Ayli asara v'nafki asara. Aili Asara, the Nafki Asara. So then another 10 would go in, and 10 out of the first group would leave. So you'd still have 30 people in the second group, even though tw- uh, 20 out of those 30 already did their avoda, they'll stay so that you have the, the critical uh, minimum number of people. And then when they're done, another 10 will come in from for the third group, and the 10 of the, re- of the original 20 will leave. And then it turns out that you had 30 original, and then additional 10 for the second group, additional 10 for the third group. And that way, even if you only have 50 Yidin in a really bad year, you still can fulfill this criteria. Now, I don't think that the Gemara is suggesting that if you don't have 50 people, you can't do the Avod of Korban Pesach. I, I, I don't, it's not mashma that way to me from the language of the Gemara. I could be wrong, I could be mistaken, but it seems that this is not Li'ikuva, that it's only a Lichat Chila. But we'd have to look in the post come and see. Like there are more than 90 Greek groups that represent all of Israel. No, no, no. We're saying technically, okay. in theory, what, what would be the minimum that you would need in order to fulfill this criterion? So the first group would come in. The Mishnah had made, has said an interesting statement. The Mishnah had said that once the temple courtyard became full, they locked the doors. So this machloikas is fascinating to me. Itmar, Abaya Omar Ninalutanan, Rava Omar Noyalintanan. Abaya says that the, the <coughs> proper reading of, a mish, of our Mishnah was that the doors were locked. And Rava says, no, the correct reading of the Mishnah is they locked the doors. Now, what's the difference between the two? My Benayhu, Ika Benayhu, Lamis Machanisa. The question is, do you rely on a miracle? Abaya Omar Ninalutanan, Kamada Aili Malu, Bisamchina Nanisa. Rava Amar Noelin Tznan Velo Samchin and Anisa. Unbelievable. The Gemara says that Abaya says there was no one in charge of locking the door. You waited for the doors to miraculously lock on your own, on their own, and that was your indication that you had to stop accepting people from for the first group. But as long as the doors stayed open, you let as many people come in as wanted to come in. They, as many would cram in as they could for the first group. And only when the door is miraculously locked on their own, that's when we say that you had to preclude anyone else from coming in. Now, where, where in the world do we ever say that we rely on miracles? We have a general principle of So one answer could be maybe the temple is different. Another answer could be is that Abaya is not to be taken literally, but that they didn't appoint anyone specific in charge of locking the door, but probably... The, um, there was such a, uh, a uh, sort of like a, um, sometimes there's movement of the masses. And sometimes there was just a public recognition that it was a hazard to allow any more people to come in. And so however it happened, the doors closed on their own, not miraculously necessarily, but that eventually enough people came to the recognition as, hey, if we don't close the doors now, we're going to be creating a t- terrible uh, health hazard to the people inside. People might get trampled, and the doors closed. I'm not really sure how to explain this, Gemara, but I'm just presenting what I'm, I'm I, as you see, I'm groping to try and understand what this means. The HUD did not. So now the Mishnah says, but let's take a look. There's a Mishnah, I believe the Mishnah is in, uh, it's in Idios. The Mishnah says that Amar Reb Yehuda Chas V'Shalom She'akavya Ben Mahalal El Nisnade She'ein Azor Nin Elas Al Kol Adam BeYisrael BeChachma Uviyir Aschet Ka'akavya Ben Mahalal El. Now it's not important for us now to go into the details of the story, but there's a suggestion made in the Mishnah that Akavya Ben Mahalal El, who was alive during Temple times, it was a great Tana. The rabbis put him into into Nidwe. They put a ban on him because he said something inappropriate about his colleagues. And <coughs> Rabbi Yehuda responded and said, God forbid that anyone should even suggest that Akavya was ever put into Cherem. And because, how could you put someone who, when he was present in the temple courtyard, once they locked the doors behind him, you would not be able to find anyone who could rival him in Chachma, in wisdom, and in Yerashchit, in the fear of sin. That's the whole point. The question now is, the word lock the doors, how do you read it in that Mishnah Idios? 
Abaya metaretz letaime, verova metaretz letaime. Abaya metaretz letaime, ein ba azara bishoshin ninala al kol adam bi yisrael bechachma bi yiraschet kakabya bin mahalal el. That Abaya will tell you is that the verb is to be read passively in the Mishnah in Idios, and that it means that when the door is locked, not that when they lock the doors, because no one actually actively was in charge of locking the doors, but when the door is locked on their own, you could not find anyone who could rival Akavya in Chachma and in Yeraschet. And Rav Mitaritz Latime, Ein Bazara Bishasha, no Linosal Kol Yisrael Bechachma Vyraschet, Kakavi Ben Mahalalel. And Rav says, no, the verb is presented in the active form in the Mishnah, meaning that they did not lock the door, or once they locked the doors, you could not find anyone who could rival a kavya in Chachma and Yerashe. So basically, the Gemara is just saying is that the same issue of how you're going to read the language of our Mishnah is same in the true. It's same as true with the Mishnah in Idios. Tanu Rabbanan, may olam lo nismayich adam ba'azara chutz mi pesach echad shahayu bi mehillel shenismayich bo zaken echad v'hayukaren oso pesach meuchin. Historically, says the Brisa, no one ever got trampled and crushed to death except for one year. It was in the times of the great Hillel. So even though Hillel was the, the, one of the greatest tzaddikim who ever lived, nonetheless, there's an indication here that there was a tremendous throng of Jews, and perhaps people were a little bit too pushy. One year, one elderly man got trampled to death in the Beis HaMikdash. This is the only time it ever happened, and they called it the Pesach of crushing, or the crushed Pesach. Tanu Rabbanu. Pam echas bikesh agripas hamelech, Litain Einav Ba'ochlose Yisrael. There was a king whose name was Agripas. He was a convert and he was not of legitimate uh, Yuchsin, but he wanted to see he wanted to see how many Jews Taka are there in this empire. Amar Leila Kohen Gadol Tenenecha Bepisachim. And so he instructs the Kohen Gadol, I want you to take a census when you get all the Jews coming to the temple on Erev Pesach, that'll be the best way to count them. So the Kohen Gadol took a kidney from every person, from every Paschal lamb, <coughs> and he counted, and there were 1.2 million kidneys, double the number of men that left Egypt. So already you're starting off with a huge number. And chutz and that's not counting the people who didn't come because they were precluded because either they were tame or they were far away. So there's even more Jews. And and every korban pesach typically had at least ten people as part of the chabur. So therefore, it's not 1.2 million; it's 12 million. At least, right? At least it's 12 million plus, right? So therefore. It's a huge number of people. Whether this is Lushan Guzma or not, I don't know. It sounds to me like it's got to be Lushan Guzma because historically, I don't know if during Temple times there were 12 million Jews. I'd be very skeptical if there were 12 million Jews in Eretz Yisrael at that time. Uh, but I don't know. I'm not. I'm just. I'm just suggesting that finished the Korban Pesach in three hollows. Yeah, and, and, and these are only males. Four million at a time. Uh, over three hundred thousand. Uh, over Bar Mitzvah. Right. So it's. Uh, but I, I do believe that it's a Lushan Guzma. And many times they look at the Maral. It'll tell you why sometimes Chazal use uh, exaggerated numbers. The Hayukaren Oso. A Grippa Street, sure. The Hayukaren Oso Pesach Meuvin. And that year they called it the thick Pesach because it just represents huge throngs of people. Now, not al kulya haboyak tura. So the Gemara says, how could the Kohen Gadol take a kidney from each carbon Pesach? You have to put that on the Mizbech. How could he take it as to, to, to count? Dahadr makterlu. The Gemara answers, okay, after he used it to count, he put it on the Mizbech later. I, the Gemara says, how could you just take a whole bunch of kidneys and dump them all on the Mizbech at the same time? The Pasuk implies that each one has to be placed down separately. So the Gemara answers, That's Taka true. Taka did not just dump a bag of kidneys on the Mizbech. He put them on one at a time. So the Gemara says, but wait a minute. But one second, that's still not going to help because the Pasuk also says that you have to take the entire body, whatever body parts are going to be taken from the Korban Pesach, the body parts have to be taken in unison. You can't put the kidney on at one stage and put the fats and the stomach on in another stage. You have to put the whole kishkas on together. So if you're if you're taking out the kidney and then putting it on later after you put the other kishkas on, that's not good. 
So elatfisa ba'alma de shalkominayo ad the oven le midi achrina. So the answer is, says the Gemara, all he did was he lifted up the kidney, showed it to his census counter, he took a bean, put it into a jar, and then gave the kidney back to the guy. It was it was just a temporary uh, 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 marker until he found the substitute. For, but used a uh, maybe he used the kidney bean. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> the first bean counter. <laughs> this is the bean counters, right? Anyway, let's go weiter. Kohanim omdim shuros shuros. The Kohanim stood in rows, right? So my time, uh, and and they and we said also that uh, you either had a purely silver row or a purely gold row. You couldn't mix and match and have bowls of silver and gold in the same row. So what's the reason? Maybe it's because of the principle of you're only allowed to ascend in holiness and not to descend. So maybe the concern is, is that maybe the Kohen would be taking back a gold bowl and giving the Kohen in front of him a silver bowl, in which case there's a descent in Kedusha and that's not appropriate. Maybe that's the reason why you can't mix and match bowls in the same row. But hachanami dilma shakli bar masnum ayli bar mea. But the Gemara says, if that's your concern, then even if all the bowls are silver or all the bowls are gold, well, we know that not all the bowls were necessarily of the same weight. Maybe there should be a concern that one bowl weighed two, was worth 200 uh, uh, zuz and the other bowl was worth only 100 zuz. And if you're concerned about malin bekaidish vein morid, then why shouldn't we be concerned even when they're made out of the same material? So ela dahachi shapir tfei. The Gemara says, really, that's not the concern, but rather the concern is aesthetics. That if you were to take a photograph of the avoda on erev pesach with these rows of kohanim, to be able to look at the glimmering silver bowls and the glimmering gold bowls to see all one uniform row of silver and one uniform row of gold aesthetically was much more beautiful than seeing just a hodgepodge of different colored materials uh, in the same row. So the Gemara now says, The bowls did not have flat bottoms, they had the cone bottoms. The only bowl, says the Brisa, in, in the entire Beis Hamikdash that had a flat bottom was the bowl or large spoon that was used to contain the frankincense that was placed on top of the showbread table. And that was, it was, you put it weekly, you put it on the showbread table together with the newly baked showbread. The reason why it had to be uh, not a, a cone shaped on the bottom is because then you'd have to prop it up against something that was on the showbread table. And we didn't want you to prop up anything against the showbread itself, against the lechem upon him, because since it was very uh, delicately shaped in the shape of a U, if you would prop something up against it, it could break the bread and uh, then ruin the shape of the bread. So then, so that's why the rabbi said, okay, we'll make one allowance for flat-bottomed uh, containers only for the levona and the lechem hapon. Next, shachat Yisrael v'kibel hakohen v'chulei, so then a Yisrael would shecht, and a kohen would do the kabbalah and onwards. So frak the gemara losagi the lav Yisrael, why does the Mishnah say that a dafka had to be a Yisrael who shechted it? What, does, you mean to tell me that it could only be a Yisrael? So the gemara says no. He gufa kamashmo and deshchita bizar kishera. That no, the Mishnah is telling me that it was acceptable. It was kosher for a, a Yisrael to do the shechita. You didn't need a kohen. But if a Kohen wants to do the Shechita, gesund or hate. The Kibel HaKohen, and then it says that the Kohen did the Kabbalah, HaKamash Malon Mi Kabbalah Ve'elach Mitzvah Kahuna. That it's necessary for Kohanim to do the Kabbalah, excuse me, from the Kabbalah and onwards, it's necessary to use a Kohen. So, no Salachavero, and then the Mishnah says, that the Kohen would pass it on a relay in the row from Kohen to Kohen to Kohen until it got to the Mizbeach. So, Shamas Mina Holacha Shalom Beregel Havya Holacha. So, the Gemara says, let's infer from here something that is deliberated in another Gemara. Is transporting the Dam up to the Mizbeach, does that transportation, that Holacha, does it require actual movement of the human body or not? Meaning, does a person, does a Kohen have to actually walk to get the blood there? Or can the Kohanim remain stationary and just relay from, from one person to the next? That question is undertaken in another Gemara, and we should be able to prove that from our Mishnah, it's acceptable not to have to walk at all. So the Gemara says, no, Dilma, who nayid purta? 
No, maybe the Mishnah is not suggesting that. Maybe the Mishnah also would require each Kohen to move slightly, to shuffle a little bit of it with his feet in order to fulfill the mitzvah of halacha. So if that's the case, then what's the point of the Mishnah telling me that it was done through relay? It's telling me that this is, again, the way to beautify the mitzvah. Instead of having a small number of Kohanim doing the avoda, the more Kohanim present, the more beautified the mitzvah is, and therefore that's why they dafka wanted to do it through relay. Kibel es hamole umachser es harekan. Notice the Mishnah is very careful to tell you that first you'd have to pass up the bowl of blood, and then take, and then only afterwards take back the empty bowl from the from the from the kohen that's in front of you. Avol ibchalo, but you can't do it the opposite. You can't take the empty bowl and then give him the full bowl of blood afterwards. Why? The answer is is because you can't do anything before you do a mitzvah. You can't delay the performance of the mitzvah. So since the holacha of the dam is part of the mitzvah, and taking the bowl, the empty bowl back is not the mitzvah. you got to do the mitzvah component before you do the non-mitzvah component. And that's why the Mishnah Davka says, pass up the full bowl of blood before you take back the empty bowl. Kohen hakor veitzel ha-mizbeach v'chulei. And then the Mishnah has said that the Kohen who's closest to the Mizbeach would splash the blood. Now the word zurika uh, implies that you splash it at a distance. You toss the blood from a distance and it hits the Mizbeach. There's another way to place blood on the Mizbeach, and that's by putting the bowl all the way touching the wall and then spilling it gently so that it flows downwards. That's called Shefiha. So there's two terms. One is Zrika and one is Shefiha. Vizarak or Vishafach. So it seems like over here that Zurika is the preferred method. Mantana Pesach Bizrika, so who is the author? Omar Rabchizda Rabyosi Haglili, that's Rabyosi Haglili. The Tanya, Rabyosi Haglili Omer, es Damam Tizrok Alamizbach, the Es Khalbam Taktir. So uh, Rabbi Yosef Lili teaches as follows. There's a section in the Torah which talks about the korban of a bechor. A firstborn animal has to be brought as a korban, and it says in the context of that korban bechor, their blood shall be pla- thrown on the mizbeach, and their fats shall be burnt on the mizbeach. Now, damo lo nemar ela damam, chelbo lo nemar ela chelbam. Now, it's very strange because the conjugation of the verb is in the plural, even though we're talking about one korban, the korban bechor. So why is that? Why is that? The Gemara says, So the Gemara tells me that there are only two times in the Torah where the Torah does not specify for that carbon what the method of dam placement is and, how you're, and what you're supposed to do with the innards. The only two places in the whole Torah where the Torah does not specify is by Meiser Behema, that every tenth animal has to be brought as a carbon, and carbon Pesach. Strangely enough, for whatever reason, the Torah does not specify by those two carbonos how you're supposed to place the blood and how you're supposed to, what you're supposed to do with the innards. So what I do is I look at the Pasuk by Bechor, which is written in the plural, and I say that that plurality is reflective on those two halachos where the Torah did not specify what the protocol was. And therefore, just like by Bechor, you have to do Zrika and not Shefiha, and you have to place the innards on the Mizbeach, so too by Meiser Behema and by Korban Pesach, you do Zrika and you do the placement of the innards on the Mizbeach. Now, Minolan did to Unin Yesod, and how do you know that the blood has to be splashed against the wall that has a protruding Yesod, as a protruding foundation? Amar Rabbi Elazar, Asya Zrika Zrika Me'ola, because now that I know that Zrika is the correct protocol for the Korban Pesach, I learned that by, I learned the uh, Zrika has to be on a wall that has a Yesod. Where do I know this? I know it from the Korban Ola. Ksiv Hacha Es Damam Tizrok Al by the Bechor it says, their blood you shall throw on the altar. So it says by the carbon ola, do zrika as well. Just like the carbon tamid, the carbon ola rather requires a, a, a yesod. You have to put the blood on the wall with the yesod. So too, by any carbon that requires zrika, you have to throw it against the wall that has a yesod. The ola gufaminol. And now, Taka, how do you know? That the carbon ola requires the use of the, the splashing against the wall with the yesod. Amar kra el yesod mizbacha ola, because the, the pasuk says explicitly that you shall place the blood 
on the foundation of the altar of the Ola. Oh. Alma Ola to Una Yisod. So that tells me that the, that the Ola requires a Yisod. Everyone have a wonderful Shabbos.